I think we have a number of people who've joined us for this evening and we can go ahead and get the program started. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Welcome, I'm Keisha Rogers and I wanna thank you for joining us for our Monday strategic discussion with Tony Pappert. Uh, Tony will be giving the overview for tonight and I'll pretty much immediately turn it over to Tony in just a moment here, because he has a lot to cover. As people know, uh, we are in the middle of a decisive battle for, for the Republic, for the nation, as we're seeing what Lyndon LaRouche once warned about in terms of a rotten criminal bureaucracy that had taken over our institutions of government, and particularly the FBI, the bureaucracies around the, uh, around the various uh, infiltration that we've seen in terms of the justice system and what has been done to the criminality in the justice system. And obviously uh, people know that that has been something that's been ongoing for decades. And as people read about in the invite that we sent out, uh, the raid on President Trump, which has become uh, something that has been like nothing really that has been seen before in our nation's history. Um, we, Lyndon LaRouche, our political action committee, our movement is very much aware of how the criminal bureaucracy works when it wants to target not just an individual, that it wants to bring down and wants to eliminate. We saw this uh, through uh, the impact that was done well back many years ago against the figure of the American statesman and patriot, Lyndon LaRouche. The same operations are working today. The ones that framed up LaRouche, the ones that raided his house, uh, are the same ones when we start with Robert Mueller, when we start with the criminal bureaucracy, rotten bureaucracy of the FBI uh, that LaRouche warned about are the ones that Trump also warned about. And the same British imperial system that actually went after uh, Lyndon LaRouche and made it clear that they were out to shut him down and destroy him are the ones that we warned about uh, from Robert Mueller's amoral uh, assassination uh, plot. Uh, Robert Mueller, Mueller, an amoral assassin, he'll do his job if you let him. People know who he is. He ran the coup against President Trump. He also ran the coup and was part of the Get LaRouche Task Force. And we'll talk about that a bit more. So when we say this is deja vu all over, but this is not just reminiscing on something of the past. This is understanding, as Trump said, they're not just this, this evil, rotten bureaucracy and LaRouche wanted the same thing, are not just going after that individual. They're out to destroy you, the American people, destroy the citizen. And Trump made this very clear in many of his speeches. So one, one thing I wanted to do first off is just to make that point clear about uh, Lyndon LaRouche's warnings. We have a one minute video. I'm not sure if everyone had a chance to take a look at it. And I want to show this. The title of the video, Cri Crimes of the Secret Government, the LaRouche case, Trump wasn't Mueller's first political assassination. And just listen to the video here. As FBI agents approached LaRouche's estate in Leesburg, Virginia, 50 miles from Washington, Police lined up outside. We have an out of control Justice Department, in my view, where the rot is not in the appointees as much as it is in the permanent bureaucracy. We have a permanent sickness in the permanent bureaucracy of part of our government. Good evening. Federal when the time came that somebody wanted me out of the way, they were able to rely upon that permanent injustice in the permanent bureaucracy of government to do the job. Always there's that agency inside the Justice Department which works for contract like a hitman when somebody with the right credentials and passwords 
walks in and says, we want to get this group of people or we want to get this person. My case may be, as Ramsey described it, Ramsey Clark described it, the most extensive and the highest level of these cases in terms of the duration and scope of the operation. And that until we remove from our system of government a rotten, permanent bureaucracy, which acts like contract assassins, using the authority of the justice system to perpetrate assassination, this country is not free, nor anyone in it. Now, today, as we said, um, when we see the same rotten apparatus going after President Trump today, uh, who was uh, the former president of the United States, you've never seen anything like this as Trump warned that has been done against uh, someone who has actually held the office of the presidency. I just want to read the uh, latest, I guess, telegrams and messages that Trump sent out today in uh, involving the FBI raid on his Mar-a-Lago, uh, his Mar home in Mar-a-Lago when he wasn't there. First, he said, America has never suffered this kind of abuse in law enforcement. For the first for the FBI to raid the home of the US, of the 45th president of the United States or any president for that matter is totally unheard of and unthinkable. This break-in was a sneak attack on democracy, our republic, and was both unannounced and done at a time when the president was not even present. It was for political, not legal reasons, and our entire country is angry, hurt, and greatly embarrassed by it. Make America great again. He later today, this was today, he later today uh, put forth another uh, telegram message where he says, wow, in the raid by the FBI of Mar-a-Lago, they stole my three passports, one ex in expired, along with everything else. This is an assault on, on a political opponent at a level never seen before in our country, third world. So this is what we're dealing with today. And the solution as we're gonna lay out and as I turn it over to Tony is that people have to turn their rage into action. We need the American citizens to rise like lions, from sleep and slumber to, as the great uh, poet Percy Bysshe Shelley once said, and the battle to defeat this evil and this criminality is that we have to win a decisive battle in the next three months, going 90 days, if you will, going into the midterm elections, going into the uh, November elections, that we're going to have America first MAGA candidates that are going to step up to provide leadership against the uniparty, the Democrats, Republicans, those who are out to destroy our nation and who are putting the livelihood of the population on the line because they're in bed with Wall Street, the city of London and the British imperial interest who's out to destroy our country by making their move to bring down the only presidential figure in the last several decades who's actually shown that his commitment is to the American people and America first. And that is, uh, that is Donald Trump and what uh, Trump can actually bring about in the aftermath of a victory in the November election uh, going into the next two years uh, and making sure that he reemerges as the leading presidential candidate and president in 2024. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, today is a very special day that Tony's going to tell us about as well, which is the 51st anniversary. Um, it's a special day because this is why Lyndon LaRouche became such a, a public enemy number one to this British imperial apparatus because prior to August 15, 1971, LaRouche made a forecast warning about 
what uh, what he knew was going to be the destructive force that happened under President Nixon with the taking down of the Bretton Woods system, the turning of the fixed exchange rate system that had been into place, nations of sovereign nations working together into the horror show of post-industrial mayhem that we saw under Nixon and that has continued and which is really what we're seeing right now with the policies uh, icing on top of the cake, should we say, coming out of the Biden administration and what's happened when our society has gone from a productive manufacturing society that Trump wanted to return the United States to uh, against this whole post-industrial rot of our economy that has taken place under uh, for the last several decades and has really manifested itself with the, uh, with the Biden administration and what they're doing to continue the destruction of the economy. So of course, this is what uh, we're faced with right now, but we have a moment of victory to actually turn this around. And let me turn it over to Tony so he can give you more of a picture of how we're gonna do that. I mean, uh, Keisha laid it out very well, and those are, things I'm, I intend to address in the next few minutes. Um, exactly what she said, the, uh, the, the relationship of the LaRouche case to the, uh, the, uh, the Trump raid of last a week ago by the same people and um, the, uh, the significance of today being August 15th, it's all extremely relevant. But let me just start by, I think briefly, because Keisha said the right things, just stress um, what we should do right at this minute. Number one, keep calm. Keep calm and organize. And listen to President Trump's call to lower the temperature. Don't make it any easier for the FBI to try to stage provocations in order to say, you know, to declare there's terrorism and all the stuff which they're trying to do just at this minute. Now, um, most of the people in the Trump movement realize all that, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, this uh, obvious. Secondly, as Keisha exactly said, these words, channel your anger into organizing, protecting the vote for the midterms and turning out a massive vote for Trump candidates for uh, Congress, the Senate, state offices, everybody, us, everybody up and down the line who's for Trump. Um, such an overwhelming turnout that uh, attempts to steal the vote, especially given our protecting the vote, uh, will fail, or at least fail to fail to to uh, fail to meet their objective. Elect people elect Trump candidates and hold them accountable. And uh, on the protect the vote, I mean, many of you are right are doing this, but if you're not, you should right now join thousands of new Republican Party poll watchers and election officers who are going to be at the polls all around the country to, to protect the vote. Now, but let's go one step further. At the same time, that Monday raid means total war in the political and cultural sphere. The, uh, there's no turning back. It's not violent warfare. It's more like what Martin Luther King did, but uh, it's nevertheless total war, politically and culturally, in depth, every place around the country. And the, the thing I want to use to describe that is uh, writings from Lyndon LaRouche, published and unpublished, from 1988. The, um, on the subject of people's war, it was most immediately uh, people's war as the, uh, as the Kuomintang uh, had uh, projected it in their war against the Jap, first against the Japanese, and then the Chinese Communist Party. Then the concept also found 
uh, with Mao Zedong and people on the communist side. But he described people's war, it, or let's call it in this context, total war, this kind of total war, as person-to-person -person cultural warfare. Again, try to stay with me closely here because this is going to go, through, go quickly. He said, in this total war, each and every person of one faction is implicitly in conflict with each and every proximate person of the opposing faction. The, uh, uh, trust that's clear. Each and every person of our faction is implicitly in conflict with each, with each and every proximate person of the opposing faction. Meaning, as, as Steve Bannon said earlier, in canvassing boards and election boards and school boards, in every institution, throughout life, this fight is going on throughout society, everywhere in society. He said, the, um, the, this involves the cultural penetration of virtually the entire range of public and private institutions of the society to turn those institutions against the adversary, either to transform them into vehicles for furtherance of our policies, or simply to neutralize their effectiveness as instruments of adversary policies. So it means a fight in every area, in every sphere, in every organization. And again, I mean, to his credit, Steve Bannon said much the same thing in his speech at CPAC in his own way, but it's the same thing. This doesn't mean, and this is speaking for myself, uh, this is not quoting from Lynn or Lyndon LaRouche, but it doesn't mean that you're always going to be strident and hostile by any means. That's not what it means at all. Sometimes honey catches more flies than vinegar, and sometimes co-optation and, in fact, friendship is the best form of confrontation. There's many cases where that's so. This is not a call to Trotskyism, but it's a call in this sense to total war. And this demands a lot of us, but this is what we're going into. It demands, as, as Lyndon LaRouche says in these writings, it demands a deeper uh, level of commitment than patriotism as it's usually understood, meaning uh, to support the existing institutions of the country. And um, that if you followed me so far, that's what I'm going to discuss now. The grounds of this deeper commitment, deeper than what is normally conceived as patriotism, which we need for the coming months and years of total war, total cultural, political, intellectual, even though not a military warfare, ceaselessly going on to November 2024, but I think probably actually beyond that as well. Now, the way I got, want to approach that is to note that Washington has been taken over by the Suicide Club. Now, the, the, it's, they're not directly relevant, but the Suicide Club was, the, uh, was a set of uh, three short stories by Robert Louis, Louis Stevenson, which are intensely interesting. Um, but you need, needn't read them to understand what I'm talking about. The, uh, to see the way we've been taken over by a suicide club, look at the West Europeans, what they're doing now. The Germans, the whole bunch of them, the French, the Italians, especially the Germans. They're preparing themselves to enter a winter of unemployment because the factories will shut down for lack of energy and for not just for lack of energy, but for lack of gas, natural gas, which is a feedstock for many of those factories. So they're preparing for a winter 
without jobs, without heat, already uh, major institutions in Germany are telling people to turn down their air conditioners and in some cases to take cold showers, but it's not even winter yet. Without heat, without jobs, without hope. I mean, they're in process of shutting down their, their economies. Uh, Germany already, before this crisis, had begun shutting down all its nuclear. It begun shutting down all its coal. Now they're wrestling with the idea, well, can we revive some nuclear? Can we revive some coal? Some say yes, some say no. They're like cattle being led to slaughter. And you know, to all appearances being led by themselves to slaughter. And so that's Germany. And again, with some notable exceptions, of course, that's Germany. But if you think that's peculiar, look at Texas. Texas had lost its electricity. Texas has more gas and oil under its uh, land than most countries in the world. But it, it ran out of energy recently and had widespread blackouts. So if you think Germany is peculiar, look at Texas. Now, again, hopefully this will become, it'll become clear to you what I'm saying if it's not already. Look at the Biden so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which just passed uh, the, the House and Senate. I, I, don't, I don't know if Biden has quite signed it yet, but it's passed both houses. The, um, well, what this is, it's the Green New Deal, as, as Donald Trump correctly said, and he called on the Democrats, he called on citizens to demand that their Democratic congressmen vote against it, which unfortunately none of them did, because it's the Green New Deal which is ruinous. What it is, it's the image of the, the mass of graft and corruption which is our defense budget, transferred over into a Green New Deal budget. Now, I mean, what's the defense budget? It's largely pure corruption. Um, I mean, you probably know that the US defense authorization bill for 2023 is nominally $850 billion. It's probably really greater. Um, and what do we have for $850 billion, right? Uh, losing the war in Iraq, uh, losing in Afghanistan, uh, losing in Syria, uh, 20 years of uh, perpetual war with nothing but losses and nothing gained. And now, certainly, we now compare that again, Russia. Uh, estimated uh, 2019, uh, 2022 defense budget, $47 billion, less than one sixteenth of ours. China, $230 billion, less than one quarter of our defense budget. Now, I admit this almost trillion dollar defense budget gives us many advantages over Russia and China, you might say. It, despite everything, perhaps overall we're military superior. But who has the hypersonic weapons? Who, who has them? Russia has them, China has them. And not just yesterday, they're deployed in the field. We're trying to get lab tests of them. The, the, our defense budget, as many people who in the know have described it, as, as uh, Colonel McGregor describes it, not in my words, but in his, which amount to the same thing. It's the self-licking ice cream cone. It's the money for the generals, 40 four-star generals. In World War II, we managed to fight war on three continents with four four-star generals. Now we manage to lose wars all over the world with 40 four-star generals. And what do they do? Well, they retire. They get a healthy retirement pay, but it's not enough. They go to work for defense contractors and they get the defense dollars which they just conduited through the DOD when they were in uniform. The Beltway bandits. Where does the $60 billion Ukraine aid go? It doesn't go to Ukraine, it goes to the Beltway. What goes to Ukraine is obsolete weapons from the bottom of the shelf, 
which don't any longer work in many cases. And then the Beltway bandits, the defense contractors, Raytheon and so on, they come up and say, well, we have to replace the weapons you sent to Ukraine. Of course, we can't replace them with old weapons. Those are out of date. We have to replace them with new weapons, which cost much more. And then in the current circumstances, they say, well, you have to pay us for them. But unfortunately, we can't provide them for a year in some cases because of supply chain problems. So where does the Ukraine aid go? It's go it goes to the Beltway. As I say, this is the self-licking ice cream cone. I'm sure many of you know this very well, and I'm not the only one. Now, what we have in the in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which is the Green New Deal, we have a massive 439 billion over four over 10 years. So, you know, that's not as much as defense, obviously, $850 billion a year. Although $440 billion over 10 years is just roughly what Russia will spend on their defense over 10 years. In any case, it's a Green New Deal, $440 billion over, over 10 years. Uh, it's supposed to be paid for by tax increases. I mean, one of them, you all know, is 85,000 new IRS agents who will wring money out of the taxpayers and you can be sure they're not going to be the wealthy wealthy taxpayers, plus a 5% minimum tax on corporations. Only 150 corporations are qualified for this, estimated to raise by some $313 billion over 10 years. Turns out that minimum tax, 50% of it, will fall on U.S. manufacturers. Then the rest of it is the Washington self-licking ice cream cone. Same thing we had under the Obama administration, the favored solar power boys, the favored corporations will get the 439 billion, 10 billion investment tax credits, 2 billion to retail uh, auto sales for electric vehicles, 20 billion loans for new electric vehicle plants, $2 billion for national labs for clean energy, the other thing it's going to do is place a commissar of Biden political correctness in charge of the National Science Foundation to make sure that even our science money doesn't go for real investment in real science, but goes for green nonsense and sex change baloney. That's what they're going to steer the National Science Foundation into. So, you know. 77 billion in tax credits, 30 billion in grants and loans, loans to green utilities, uh, so on and so forth. It's all, I mean, they subsidize electric cars. Now, in principle, there's nothing wrong with electric cars, but at present, they can only be afforded by, afforded by wealthy people. So the auto companies are laying off workers who make glass gasoline cars in order to later make electric cars, which people are not going to be able to afford right now. And nor do we have the grid uh, to charge these cars on a large scale if they could afford them. So it's a whole utopian scheme to spend $440 billion supposedly reducing carbon dioxide, which is ridiculous. It's a will of the wisp. It's worthy of Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. But really what it is, is the self-dealing, financial self-dealing, backslapping, which were the same thing we see in the defense budget every year. Only here, it's much more harmful because the defense, bu defense budget produces this junk, you know, which you can see. It's well, if you get the right reports, if you get true reports. You can see that in Ukraine, it doesn't work very well on the battlefield. Um, the, I mean, basically, you know, with our defense budget supposed, approaching a trillion dollars a year, we created a military establishment which was pretty good at bombing and shooting people in uh, in skirts or you know in in uh, in tribal dress in deserts, uh, but not really quite up to it 
against any modern army which knew what it was doing, which we haven't fought since, uh, I mean, at best since Korea, really, or maybe you'd say since Vietnam. Now, but the green, the green thing is much more harmful because everything they accomplish will positively take down the U.S. economy. Nothing will, nothing they're doing will advance the economy in any respect. Everything will make things worse. Just as when the governor of Texas decided to go from the state's plentiful uh, petroleum and natural gas uh, to go into wind power because there was money to be given out for wind power. There was no sense to it, just money. And we see what that did to the energy grid in Texas. Now we're gonna do the same thing only worse with the whole national grid, shut down reliable power sources, coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, in favor of unreliable, unpredictable power sources, wind and solar. Nobody knows when the wind is gonna be blowing, Nobody knows when the sun is going to shine, and nobody knows when these dark or you know uh, calm periods will strike. There's no way to account. There's no way to uh, to build for it. There's no way to account for it. You get a fourth world power grid, and having paid four hundred forty billion dollars for it, so maybe that begins to give you the notion that. What we have in Washington is a suicide squad. It's the same suicide squad which is leading the Germans to their self-destruction. It's the financial apparatus headquartered in the city of London, which has taken over this country progressively, especially since, as Keisha said, August 15th, 1971. I mean, after a whole bunch of tricks by the city of London, Richard Nixon was conned by George Shultz into taking the dollar off the gold reserve standard and plunging the dagger into the Bretton Woods system, which had resulted in the greatest period of world economic growth known in history. Now, it wasn't universal. It was largely limited to the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and certain other sectors in Asia, not including China. So it wasn't growth for everybody. But given the limitations, US, Western Europe, Australia, some locations in Asia, this was the greatest continued growth we had ever seen in human history, as far as we know. It ended with Nixon in 71. And what happened with the petrodollar, which with the which was well, first with the euro dollar, which are dollars created by London banks without the okay and necessarily even the knowledge of the US Treasury or the Federal Reserve. Most dollars are created in this way today in the offshore markets as euro dollars. Nobody in this country has control. Of them. We went to the complete deregulation of the financial system from 71, finally in 99, we took down the Glass-Steagall Act, which had given us financial stability in the US from its passage in 33 till it was taken down in 99 uh, and went straight toward the crash of 2008 and as which we got out of by the same bad medicine that got us in there so that we're heading for another worse crash of that sort today. We went into the fan financialization of everything, the dictatorship of finance, the dictatorship of the Federal Reserve, and the takedown of manufacturing over the period from the 90s, but especially the 21st century. Again, as most of you know, is some a lot better than me. I mean, simultaneous, the British-centered oligarchy, and this was directly triggered by the British royal family, particularly by the late Prince Philip. Um, the British royal family went heavy into ecology, which is which has become this carbon climate fad of today. But its origin before World War II from the British monarchy through their agents, such as the Huxleys, the Huxley brothers and uh, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Um, Wells. Um, the uh, a movement which before the war they called 
eugenics. And the premise of eugenics was that there were too many people. The earth couldn't support all these people, especially there were too many dark-skinned people in countries in the Southern Hemisphere and other nasty places. And we should reduce their numbers in the interests of everybody. But World War II, Hitler came along World War II, and the Huxleys found that eugenics had a bad name and could not be revived under that name. And instead, they revived it as ecology. Ecologism. And so 1971, August 15th, the dollar was taken off gold. The previous year, 1970, April 22nd, 1970, was the first Earth Day. And we've gone, you know, from the ozone, those who lived through it know all this, we've gone from fraud after fraud. First, the ozone hole, now it's the CO2. First, global warming, they can't show warming. They show, they call it climate. Every time there's a hurricane, they say somehow the hurricane was caused by climate change and CO2. It's just a laughable superstition, if it not for the fact that the real demand is the same. Reduce the human population. Man is interfering with nature. Reduce the human population. So they have succeeded in stopping through strangling, just as they're strangling financial flows for petroleum exploration here in the US, they've already strangled financial flows for coal-fired power generation in third world countries, most of them, except for India, which is going strongly ahead with it. Of course, China, probably you wouldn't consider a third world country, but India and China are going strongly ahead with coal-powered coal-powered fire generation. Uh, South Africa, maybe, I'm not sure. But most of them find that they can't do it because they can't get any financing for it because of guidelines coming out of the British, coming out of the city of London, um, coming out of uh, Carney, the former Bank of England head, and uh, the ESG regulations, which are attempting to shut down energy production in the US. Trump fought that. Many states, Texas, and many, many others are fighting that today. Biden, of course, is going along with it. So as we sit here today talking, we're plunging the developing sector countries into uh, power uh poverty below power i mean they didn't have it these are the countries where there is not electrification today i mean if you as we've shown on this on this uh show if you fly around the world uh you see where there's human habitation at night you see lights well obviously electric lights fly over africa you don't you see human habitation a lot of it without lights at night and what this so-called green program aims to do is make that still worse than it is today. Um, I mean, as, as you know, was said to uh, Madeleine Albright, hey, this is on tape, you know, when she was told in an interview that the sanctions on Iraq had killed 500,000 children, she was asked, was it worth it? She said, oh yes, in the last, it's a, it's a hard price to pay, hard for her to pay. Uh, you know, very hard for her. But uh, it, in the last analysis, it is worth it to kill half a million children in Iraq. Well, that's what we're doing now through the green agenda in Africa and incipiently in Central and South America and other underdeveloped locations by ruling out uh, coal-fired power, which is the basic cheap source for them. Um, we're condemning millions of children to death. So this is the, and you know, the, the thin ruling stratum, which uh, applies all these measures against us is because you've noticed this if you've lived a few years, 
the thin ruling stratum exemplified by Biden and these, you know, these Ivy League hackneyed kids who who are his, uh, you know, National Security Council, the State Department, this thin elite stratum is going down and down and down morally. They're the golems, that is, in effect, the robots of the London-centric financial oligarchy. I mean, as Christ said of his torturers, they know, they know not what they do. So it's, it's the most extreme form of Malthusianism that's taken, for, taken over our governing institutions, even if it doesn't always call itself <coughs> Malthusianism. I mean, one thing I might have said, just going back a stage, is a key turning point in this was the collapse of the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact military alliance around 1989. Um, because then, as this financier oligarchy saw it, in the absence of the threat from the East, which, you know, they weren't. They had their feet in the East as well as the West. It wasn't, wasn't a unilateral threat to them. But in the absence of the threat to the East, there was no longer to reason to maintain modern industrial society in the West. What's the need for it? There's no longer the threat from the Soviets. So let's just take it down. We've never really much liked modern society. It, it makes people too uppity. They lose their respect for their natural superiors. Let's get rid of it. And that was a turning point. It, was, it became a turning point for the United States to turn away totally from manufacturing and from scientific advance uh, into you know, pure information age, entertainment, and rot, and with it, the genocide of our people, especially our producer classes, with 100,000 annual deaths from opioid overdoses, which is now rising. So almost twice the total deaths from the seven-year Vietnam War, if you want to call it that, occur every single year, completely needlessly from fentanyl. And these guys refuse to act on it. They won't do anything because they ultimately they it's doing the same thing they're doing. It's getting rid of excess people. Now the I mean you probably say about this elite stratum that uh so called that this is certainly not elite in any sense of morality or knowledge and reality, but you probably say about this elite stratum that they've forgotten God. Um, and that's true. And what they've also forgotten, which is politically important, is they forgot the divine spark in man, or more than forgot it, they oppose it, they deny it. They deny the divine spark in man. The divine potentiality in the human mind. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche told us, I don't know, he probably wrote this down someplace, but I don't know where it is. He told us of a meeting he had with a British oligarch. He knew yeah, the guy is probably, he was pretty old. He's probably long deceased now. But he told us of a meeting with a British oligarch he knew, I think in the 80s, who spoke to him for a while, then got up vehemently and simply said, you're wrong. There is no divine spark in man. So this is what we're fighting for. And the, the place we're fighting for it, among others, is in the physical economy. It's the physical economy as against the financial side of the economy or the financial paper economy. It's in the physical economy that the divine potentiality of the human mind is expressed. And you know, this can be approached in various ways, but what of the, the physical economy of the United States? 
what's characterized us from the very beginning of Franklin's discoveries in electricity. Our country, Benjamin Franklin, made the first far-reaching discoveries in static electricity and the, the significance of those discoveries, if for anybody who studies Franklin's work and its influence, the significance of those discoveries went far beyond static electricity. Electricity started, well, it started before, but a great part of the start of electricity was American. And what did we follow it with? Well, the railway. We didn't discover the railway here, but we deployed it on a massive scale to link up a continental country. And what we linked it to, the telegraph. Again, electricity, the telephone. These have been the features of the physical economy of our country as it's revolutionized our life through the 18th century, much of the 19th century, much of the 20th century, until you know, reversals occurred of the type we're discussing in the 20th century and the 21st. Um, and I mean, as was pointed out by our first settlers, man's love for his own kind is expressed first and foremost through the physical economy which enables us to raise families. It enables us in a better time, it was better in every respect really, in a better time in the 20th century to have the norm of our manufacturing workers that a single wage supported a family with a wife and children more numerous than anybody has now at home to be raised at home by their own parent, a single wage from manufacturing. This we had thanks to our physical economy before it was taken over and financialized under this system. Now, the center of that, of course, is the Federal Reserve, which runs, which issues our currency illegally or unconstitutionally, if you read the Constitution, which issues our currency to not to uh, credit for lending in the real economy, but to uh, select 24 dealer banks the largest banks in Manhattan and some of the largest banks around the world. So the, uh, I mean, from that stems and, you know, we have a lot about this. We have a whole page on this on our website. You can read about it. But, but from that stems our demand, which is being more and more widely heard, to uh, shut the Federal Reserve and reinstitute the Bank of the United States which would be the third bank of the United States. So in that way, and Steve Bannon echoed this, you know, in a way, uh, in, you can watch or read his speech to see what he said. Steve, Steve Bannon echoed this in his CPAC speech. Um, a, a bank owned by the American people, which would issue credit, uh, not for bailing out Wall Street speculation, which is what the Fed does, but credit, uh, for advances in physical economy, advances in the productivity of labor through science, manufacturing, mining, agriculture, transportation, and so on. The, the, uh, there's a fine, I mean, there's maybe a lot to discuss in what I said, but there's one final element I want to take up before just opening for discussion, which is the... Um, the exceptional leader. I was just reading a, a long a pamphlet or a short book by Lyndon LaRouche from 2004 called Earth's Next 50 Years. It's extremely rich and rewarding. So I think December 2004. Uh, in it, he discusses the exceptional leader and I mean, a way to introduce it, although it may be a way to introduce that discussion, as he really does, is classical tragedy, in which 
I mean, LaRouche's idea of tra classical tragedy, which probably many, many of you are familiar with, it's not really original with him. It just, Friedrich Schiller expressed very much the same thing, that classical tragedy shows you true history, a, uh, a foreign culture, not necessarily overseas foreign, but a foreign culture separated from us in time and probably in place as well, with its own distinctive ways of thought, which is with its own distinctive axioms, reaching a crisis as we are today in the United States, in the transatlantic, and in the world generally as a result, reaching a crisis where its accustomed ways of thinking, its built-in axioms, it's truths which are never questioned, like free trade, for example, or an example Lynn cites in this connection in this book, we must have an independent central banking system. That's not to be questioned. It's an axiom. So a society reaches a situation where continuing to follow their axioms leads them only into disaster and self-destruction. And this describes a Shakespeare's tragedies. It describes Hamlet. It describes King Lear very clearly. I mean, I, I, shouldn't, I should finish pretty quickly, but it's just of interest in that connection that uh, in that discussion, Lynn says, as, as others back to ancient times have said, there's a law in tragedy that the leading character is not standing on stage as the curtain opens. He's only brought in later. And if you think of the great tragedies, that's true. What happens before he's brought on? He can't be brought on until the reader is initiated implicitly into the great contradiction of that society. The way it's axioms are failing it's you don't see i mean you don't see all this consciously but you can sense it if it's done right this great contradiction must precede the entrance on stage of the leading character whose job it is to solve it to overcome it to point a way to the future although you know, all too often in tragedy as such, he fails. He may struggle with these received ideas which doom him in a society, but he gives up before he's, he's able to succeed. So that's the reason. And think of what goes on, those of you who know the plays, think of what goes on before Lear is seen on stage. And think of what goes on before Hamlet. Think of what goes on before Julius Caesar is first seen on stage. It's exactly that. So the so the uh, the opposite of that, the the different kind of leader is one who overcomes the tragedy. And, and, you know, this is, I mean, Schiller and implicitly also Plato and Socrates called this, this is goes beyond the tragic. This is the sublime. It's not tragic, it's sublime. This is the hero who goes beyond the tragedy. And what Lynn calls it, what Lyndon LaRouche calls that leader in this book, and uh, finish quickly. He said, in contrast to that, all great leaders who have led a culture to safety, away from the consequences of the culture's own folly, have been inevitably exceptions to what that culture would have been likely to recommend on the average as acceptable choices. Such exceptions include the elections of U.S. presidents Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Charles de Gaulle as president of the Fifth Republic. The principle of eliminating such exceptions at crucial moments is shown in the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, or the assassinations of the crucially important 
Jürgen Ponto, and Alfred Herrhausen, Herrhausen at critical moments of German's history. These were leading bankers who were trying to lead the way out of the crisis, the diff two different related crises as they were assassinated. The happier cases of apparent historical accidents, such as Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt, were not really accidents. They were willful choices of role adopted by persons who, because they had been developed and self-developed to go against the culture's accepted habits, were able, under the special conditions of opportunity which a crisis often presents, to lead toward a result which proved an exception to their culture's otherwise fatefully unhappy predilections in time of critical choices. So, prospective leaders, leaders suspected of harboring such lurking unwanted capabilities within them are usually eliminated from the scene one way or another, as was done to me by collaborative efforts between, among others, both by US, both my US and Soviet adversaries over the issue of my role in prompting the Strategic Defense Initiative proposal over the course of the 1983 to 1989 interval. That I think that, that says what should be said about it. And you see that, you know, LaRouche was, was raided by the FBI, framed up and imprisoned for five years to uh, keep him from getting uh, the influence which he was getting at that time, ultimately due to his role in, which, in uh, changing uh, the uh, policy of the Reagan administration to the Strategic Defense Initiative. And this was a this was a great achievement, you know, which had all the uh, all the things he'd achieved in his life thus that far from the 1950s, even the late 1940s, culminated in the Strategic Defense Initiative. And uh, the this enemy, the same enemy, uh, as we've as Keisha noted, with the same Robert Mueller in the same leading position. Uh, the same enemy was then in the Justice Department, the same enemy which uh, now is attempting to frame Trump or has been attempting to frame Trump for five years, um, framed Lynn, sent him to jail. Now, uh, this prevented him from reaching, uh, he was one of those exceptional leaders, but they, they, you know, they attempted to, first they wanted to kill him, that didn't work out. Uh, but they wanted to stop his influence. They didn't. We're still here, and uh, you know he um, he stuck to his guns. He stuck to his faith. He stuck to his beliefs. We kept organizing, and we're organizing today. So that maintained that this network and these ideas, which were instrumental, as many people like Roger Stone have pointed out, but it's obvious in any case, were instrumental. Uh, in the Trump presidency. And now, you know, Trump is that same form of exceptional leader. He's not the same as LaRouche. They're totally different. Neither of them the same as Franklin Roosevelt. But um, he is that exceptional leader. It's very interesting that uh, LaRouche's account of this says that, I, I may not have said that in what I read, but he said it. LaRouche's, it says, LaRouche's account says that as exceptional as they are, the means of their becoming leaders is totally exceptional, is equally exceptional. And uh, I mean, you see that with LaRouche, if you know anything about it. You see it with de Gaulle. You see it with Joan of Arc. I mean, this is a story which can hardly be believed. That, uh, that God spoke to an illiterate adolescent peasant girl in France and told her to lead the armies of France to break Europe free from the slavery to the Venetian Norman system of international usury, the predecessor to what we face today and to set France on the road to becoming the great nation which it did. 
and which was integral. France's development as the first modern nation state was integral to everything that has come since, including the United States. And who could believe, as Mark Twain wrote, that a kingdom uh, would give its armies to the command of a 16-year-old illiterate peasant girl. And having do that, having done that, would defeat the strongest military power in Europe, which they did. So um, the uh, so I think that you know that covers it. I hope that creates something of a uh, of a picture that you can respond to.